الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Before we get started tonight just two books we're going to introduce briefly or maybe just one of them depending on how much time we have and what we see fit The first book is a book that is a must have for any serious and self-respecting student of علم الحديث or علوم الحديث any self-respecting student of hadith, studying hadith in Arabic, and is serious, he has to have this book in his library with regards to the discipline and the subgenre of ilm rijal the science of men. ilm uh, rijal biographical evaluation. ilm al-jarhu ta'dil, ilm al-ruwat, the narrators of hadith. And it's a book uh, by a great scholar of the 4th century, it says, Al Kamil fi du'afa il rijal. Al Kamil fi du'afa il rijal, ta'lif al Imam, al Hafiz, Abi Ahmed, Abdullah ibn Adi al Jurjani, who died in the year 365 of the Hijra, commonly known as Ibn Adi. Ibn Adi. He has a large, exhaustive work in which he put together a great list of narrators. Who are either totally weak, predominantly weak, or there is a great deal of khilaf about them, and much of what has been said about them is true and accurate regarding their inaccuracy in hadiths, their lack of dubt in the Prophet Wasallam's hadith tradition, whether it's due to lying or making awful mistakes or just having poor memory, etc. etc. So this tahqiq, this uh, version. This edit of the book is of several volumes, and there are other prints as well. Ibn Adi, rahimahullah, was from the 4th century. So obviously he's very close, and he's living in the time period of Riwayah, even though it's not in the 3rd century, but he's not that far behind. 7th century, 8th century, he's still close by. And hadiths, for a very large part, if not all of them, were reported with the Isnads in the 4th century. So Al-Hafidh ibn Adi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he starts off his book before he talks about uh, the first narrator, his name Ibrahim, his name Ahmed, starting with Alif, and how the ulama of Hadith chose to begin their books and order their books and categorize their books, uh, alphabetical order or not, starting with the Prophet's name, starting with Ahmed, one of the Prophets, all his name, etc. He makes a very uh, beneficial introduction like many of the scholars did. He, he says, Abwaabun jami'atun fil kadhibi. وَتَشْدِيدِ الْعُقُوبَةِ فِيهِ His first introduction he says أَبْوَابٌ جَامِعَةٌ All sorts of chapters that are comprehensive that speak on lying and the severe punishment of lying i.e. one of the cornerstones of the sciences of hadith are those texts from the Quran and the Sunnah that warn us against lying being untruthful being with people that are untruthful that are liars and especially lying upon the Prophet Wasallam. That was the gravest sin. And that was the biggest of the cardinal sins in the Hadith tradition is when a narrator lied. And if the narrator didn't lie intentionally, his severe inaccuracy and his sloppiness and what he's saying and reporting that makes the halal haram, haram halal, punishment, reward, etc. is just like lying. You're telling the people about something which isn't true. So whether you lie intentionally or unintentionally, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Man kathaba alayya muta'amidan falyatabawa maqa'adahu min al-nar Whoever lies with me intentionally should take his seat in hell. And there are other versions of the hadith that says, Man taqawwala alayya ma lam aqulhu Whoever says something about me that I didn't say, whoever quotes me, and I didn't actually say the thing, should take his seat in the fire of hell. And many scholars have explained in detail is that this hadith includes those who lie on him intentionally, a fabricator, and those who don't have the necessary precaution, don't have the necessary accuracy, don't have the necessary training and qualifications to deal with hadiths, and they talk about them, and they mention them, and they speak on them. As if he lied on the Prophet intentionally. And the example is given of that of a man who's fishing. A man, he fishes in a place in which there are good fish and there are bad fish. He fishes in a place in which there are signs. All sea life. 
All fish from this pond aren't edible. This fish has this poison or this toxic in it. You have to have a license for this and a license for that. There are other things in the water that you shouldn't take out. And he just throws his hook and heedlessly reels in anything that snags and pulls and, and, and tugs on his line. And then he eats it. He's blameworthy because he put himself in a situation without the necessary knowledge, without the necessary qualifications. So it matters not whether he gave someone fish that was poisoned on purpose or not. And that's the concept of being inaccurate, talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You are the allow on him on purpose or by accident. And no one can say, well, I didn't mean to make a lot on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because you shouldn't be talking about the things which you have what? No knowledge of, especially the, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Halal and the Haram, etc. So he says, الباب الأول من ذلك باب من أقلل الرواية عنه صلى الله عليه وسلم مخافة الزلة. The first chapter, he mentions the Sahaba that refused to narrate in abundance from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. The companions who were never allowed the Prophet intentionally, but they were so scared and terrified that they chose to just minimize their تحديث. I'm only going to mention a few statements of the Rasul, a few stories. That's it. Even though I was with the Prophet Sallallahu day and night. I was with the Prophet Sallallahu from the beginning to the end. I was with the Prophet for five years, for ten years. I was with the Prophet for 23 years. But I'm so afraid and I'm so scared of that hadith, I'm only going to tell a little because I'm afraid of making a mistake. And it's a tremendous, tremendous chapter that all students of hadith need and all students of knowledge need. Rather, the people today need this on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Myself, we all need this. All right? The next chapter, he says, Al-Bab Thani, وزر الكذب على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أضل به الناس. He talks about the sin of he who lies upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when he misleads a person. It's halal. It's okay. It's not obligatory. It's not haram. It's not real. Allah doesn't have this attribute. Oh no, this, this is not a mandatory. You don't have to say this. He, he misleads the people. This, he's going to get a tremendous sin. Al Bab al the third chapter. شدة عقوبة من كذب على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فيحل الحرام ويحرم الحلال. Chapter 3 is the severe punishment for he who lies upon the Messenger of Allah making the halal haram halal haram. Uh, similar to the previous chapter but more specific. The first one was misguidance. And the second one was making the rules topsy-turvy. Al-Bab al-Rabi' A'adhamun kathibi wal kathibu ala Rasulullah laysa kal kathibi ala ghayrihi The worst lie is to lie on the Messenger of Allah. Lying on yourself, lying on your grandchildren, the souls of your grandchildren, your grandmother, your tribe, your family, this scholar, this sheikh, the greatest lie is to lie upon Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And then he mentions the fifth chapter. Al-Kathibu ala Rasulullah sallam la yurihu rahatil rayhat al You won't smell the fragrance of paradise if you lie upon the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And he mentions all the tafriat, the different extensions of the punishment and the warning of being inaccurate, lying upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And all this comes before he actually talks about the narrators. And that's his foundation. And then from among these uh, introductory chapters, he mentions menis tajaza takdeeb al ruat The scholars from the Sahaba on down or on up who held it lawful and believed it to be permissible to claim that the liars are liars, to point them out and to call them kathabin. And that's because the science, is, the science of men, ilm rijal talking about the honor of a Muslim, saying someone's weak, someone's a liar, is extremely dangerous. And that's because the asr of the Muslim's honor is that it's sacred. And you're not supposed to expose and take a stab at the Muslim's honor unless there's a clear proof for that. So it's dangerous. And those ulama, they took upon that danger because of the other dangers and the necessity of preserving the deen, so on and so on and so forth. So with regards to this great science, this is a book that you should have in your library. And inshallah ta'ala, the more you study and the more properly you're trained, you research, you use the book, for what Imam Ahmed said, what Ibn Ma'in said about the narrators, the Ahadith Munkara, and there's so much that you can give from this book with regards to Ilm al-Takhrij, Ilm al-Ilal, etc. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. The next book here is an Islamic book. Well, I consider it an Islamic book, but it's not actually, you know, an Islamic book. It's a gift that I got a few years back, about a year and a half, uh, from some of my students in Canada. And it says, Banzai. Huh? It's a tree on bonsai trees, or a book on bonsai trees. A patient art. It's not an art for those who are in haste, or those who are like big and fast and flashy, but it's an art of what? Patience. Anyone who's raised, who's living in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken, it was the late 80s? Late 80s, also. Oh, 
Okay, late 80s or the 90s, we know about what? Mr. what? Miyagi. Miyagi. <laughs> the bonsai tree, the karate kid. All right? And don't, don't underestimate that film. That was a tremendously paramount film. Okay? In light of the past relations with the United States and Imperial Japan, the land of the rising sun. All right? So that movie, among other things, helped merge the gap of how people looked at each other from Japan and from America. All right? let alone the whole culture and art, or the whole culture of martial arts. Uh, but the life lessons of the old sage, the seasoned veteran teacher, and the young greenhorn student, the hasty student, the short-sighted student, the student that's in a rush, the student that becomes frustrated, the student that has a full cup pulling and spilling all over the floor. But why, but why? And he says, what? Just relax. We all know wax on what? Wax off. And how everything that I'm teaching you, you may think it's a waste of time, or you're babbling and you're talking and you're not answering a question and this, and why are you talking about this and why are you talking about that? There's a what? A tremendous wisdom behind it. But you're just too hasty, too impatient to go through with it. And this is what we believe in here in Hadith Disciple. It's to trust your teacher and to empty your cup. Empty your cup, trust your teacher. All right? Have faith in your teacher. And obviously, there's a reason why he's a teacher. It's the reason why he's older than you, more experienced than you. It's the reason why she's the one who's the mu'allima and you're the tamida. It's the reason behind that. So we, we, those who grew up in that era, they know about that. And they know the famous iconic scene of the what? The bonsai tree. And how difficult and how hard it was to clip it, to trim it, to grow it, etc. And as many poets say, the patience to watch a flower grow. The patience to watch what? Flower. A flower grow. Just think how much patience you need. The patience to have a tree grow, let alone a small, tiny what? Tree. tree. Everyone understand this? So this book here, it says that it's a patient, a patient, a patient, a patient art, a, the bonsai collection of the Chicago Botanic Garden, right here in the United States. And they're lovers of connoisseurs of these types of arts wherever you go. So we see an old master, white hair, huh? With regards to trimming and clipping the tree, very beautiful scene, scenery here. And just think about Allah Azzawajal, he's the one who made these trees. And he made these trees for our purpose, for our use, for our benefit, and for us to reflect. Allah did not make these trees for mushriks, to worship nature, or to worship their craft or their art. He did not make these trees to worship an emperor or some person that you're serving and dying for. The shirk in the aqid of shirk. He made these trees for the Muslims, for the ibad rahman So it should never be a thing in which we are too shy or... Oh, it's, you know, weird or strange or Sufi or why are you talking about? We deserve this what? More than they do. Allah made the trees for us on earth, huh? The believers. So we have some very, very, very nice images here. High quality photos. The different types of bonsai trees. The different variations. The hybrids. Japanese white pine. Very exquisite tree, huh? The different uh, types that have some type of flower or flowers or fruit. Of course, we all know, yeah, I mean, in the modern times today, people talk about cherry blossoms and pear blossoms, plum, plum blossoms, things like this. You know? Very, very nice book. In my humble opinion, a book like this, among other books, is extremely soothing to the eyes. Calm you down, soothe you, and just take some time out your day and reflect on Allah's creation. Take some time out today and think about the beauty of Allah, Azzawajal's khalq, and why it's there. And what do we get from it as Muslims? And most importantly, think about paradise. Huh? Tuba. What is the interpretation of Tuba? How big is that tree? How long will it take a person to get from one end to the next under the shade of that tree? How Allah talks about how Zillan, huh? the 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 the, 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 the shadow, the shade of Jannah. Huh? And how it won't be, yani, they won't find the shams, and nor would it be too hot. So just think about paradise. And of all the things that Allah Azza wa could have promised his uh, fearful and obedient and observant slaves, he promised them a garden. And the first thing you think about in the garden is what? A tree, a bush, a shrub. So there's wisdom in that. And of course it's unfortunate, like many, many other things that we talk about in the Hadith disciple culture, tea, other things, that the non-Muslims have monopolized the things. And the Muslims are behind and lacking. And when a Muslim talks about it or enjoys it, they say, oh, He's this, and why are you so that, and oh, that's a mushrik thing. Oh, mushriks like bonsai trees. Mushriks drink this type of tea. Huh? Where's the sugar? Where's the milk? Mushriks do this. And that's sad, because the asr is supposed to be what? 
we're supposed to be the ones using this. You don't understand this? How many Muslim coffee shops do we have today? Big, big corporate names. You have Starbucks and Costa and this coffee and those coffee, Folgers and... Uh, Blue Mountain. Blue Mountain, huh? Blue Mountain. The lands of uh, Jamaica, the noble <laughs> lands. The Blue Mountain, that's right. Our center, right? Then we have the different types of coffee, right? Who are the ones that found the use of coffee? Coffee beans, coffee berries. Well, the Muslims. How do we allow the non-Muslims to take coffee and to dominate it and to monopolize it and to turn into a billion-dollar conglomerate business? And there was a time and a period in which Christians in Christendom were prohibited from drinking coffee. You could not drink coffee living in the lands of Western Europe as a Christian because it was a Mohammedan drink. It was a Muslim drink, a pagan idol god following drink. And now look what? The Muslims, they want coffee. Where do they go? To the non-Muslims. We go to them. We spend our money to them. Where do, they, where do those bucks go? What star do those bucks go to? You want to understand the point I'm trying to get to? So this is some of the things that we believe in, is that it shouldn't be a thing in which it's shirk or Sufi or this and that. The asal is the kitab and the sunnah. All right? And the same applies to what? Anything else. And Allah surely knows best. Faddo. I have a question from Sheffield UK. Your experience regarding couples that get married, they live far away, working, traveling, etc. We answered this a couple of days ago, I believe. And I'll say in brief, it depends on your setup. It depends on your attention. It depends on how flexible and how maneuverable you are. It can work if you want it to work. And it can be a disaster if you don't deal with it properly. In which the woman demands a certain lifestyle that the man can't give. Or the man wants something from the woman that the woman can't give. She says, please don't get me to move from my country. I can't come to your country from day one. You agree to that. You can't say, now you got to what? Come to America. And if not, then, you know, well, how can that, all right? Or a career. A woman is a doctor. A man's a doctor or a scholar or something like this. But with that being said, if you want it to work, if you're understanding and respectful, and if you take the good out of the situation, it can what? It can work, and it's not impossible. It's not rocket science. It's not some type of chemistry or some egghead type of science. My wife lives in another country. I have the ability to visit her twice a year. This is how long I stay. This is what I do for her financially. She comes visit me, so on and so forth, and we're happy. Alhamdulillah. Whether I have one wife or three wives or whatever. If you want it to work, it can what? It can work. If you really like a person, if you really love a person, if you're attracted to a person, if you admire a person for their dean, for their beauty or their money, whatever you're getting married for, it can what? It can work. And there are many people that do have long distance relationships, but they're understanding people. They're reasonable people. Huh? And they find the good out of that situation. Allah surely knows best. Brothers that are released from prison? Brothers that are released from prison have little to no knowledge. I have no special opinion about them. You said advice or opinion? Advice. advice. Oh, same advice for anyone else. Seek knowledge of the dean. Step by step, piece by piece, take baby steps. Avoid fanaticism. Avoid personality worship. All right? We know where we come from, huh? the jailhouse scholar, the jailhouse lawyer, the jailhouse doctor. Not saying that someone can't have knowledge in jail, because there you find some great minds in prison, some of the best. But when it comes to a person who never studied formally, is talking about this, speaking about this, warning from this person, I need to know the position on this, I need to know that, avoid that. Avoid that. Slow down and take your time. Just just chill out. It's not gonna hurt you to just what? Slow down just a bit, inshallah. Time. Start off with a rowboat before you get into a speedboat. Hitting those waves and just relax. Mahalan. Take it easy. The Prophet told him, he said, walk slowly. Go to the battlefield, what? Calmly, slowly. All right? Third piece of advice is, is to reflect on Allah's blessing upon you of being locked up. Many people accept Islam in jail and they were kufar on the streets. Many people started making salat in jail and they were missing prayer on the streets. Many people were living a wicked lifestyle and they were what? 
pious in jail. And there are some people who may have been innocent. No doubt about that. Many people in jail are innocent. And they didn't do the crime. Or if they did a crime, it's not deserving of 10 years of punishment. It's not deserving of 15 years out of their life. It's not deserving of five years. But a person from another race or another age or another gender gets a slap on the wrist. Six months with a fine. But you get 10 years. And then you can't get a job. You can't get hired. That's unfair. That's lul. However, reflect on it. Think about Yusuf, alayhi salatu wasalam. Think about Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah. Think about the righteous people that were locked up for no sin, no crime whatsoever. So be, be, be reflectful of Allah's blessings and make the best out of your situation. If you weren't involved in crime, if you weren't involved with mistakes, even before Muslim, try to give back to your community. Warn against drugs, warn against crime, warn against alcohol, warn against these things. Huh? Make that your, your toba and your purification. And most importantly, قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ استقيم. Say, I believe in Allah, then be upright and steadfast. Wallahu alam. Questions from Toronto. Is it appropriate for me to send Islamic fawaid advices to non mahram family members? It depends on what type of dealings you have with them. The phone and contacting someone by phone. Yeah, I need people have things that are right and people have things that are wrong. Is it permissible to contact someone via phone if you're not married to them? Is it haram? Is it khalwa? Are you secluding yourself with them? But what relationship do you have with those non mahram men? Some people, they go to work, they go to school, they talk with non-mahram men, so on and so forth, but when it comes to the phone, they say, what? Oh, I can't send the message. You understand what I'm saying to you? Or you, you may sit and eat with your non-mahram family members. Okay? So it depends on your relationship that you have with them from the what? From the get-go. If you have a basic respectful relationship, which is permissible to have, assalamu alaikum, how you doing, such and such, we brought some gifts for the family, we brought some gifts for your mother, that bets. You send them for wide in a broadcast list or a, a list of people, not mess. Not mess. Al Muhim, don't go extreme in your religion and at the same time take precaution. It's a simple, easy balance. It's not haram to contact someone to send someone a text message or a faida. Especially if it's in a what? Hadha huwa. Hadha huwa. All right? Wallahu alam. And this was EN Melbourne, Australia. Assalamu alaikum, Mufti. What is the difference between slavery that was permissible in Islam and the slavery that was practiced in America? Questions from Melbourne With regards to slavery that's permissible in Islam And the slavery that was practiced in America and elsewhere I would say Is that there are things that are the same And there are things that are different Slightly And there are things that are very different So the parallels between slavery That is allowed in Islam And slavery that is Or was practiced in the south or other parts of the world A slave is a slave I treat you kindly I treat you harshly I beat you, whatever I do to you, but you're a slave. The concept of bondage and putting a price on a human being and another human being owning another human being, that in itself is a deep concept. Okay? And the concept of free versus slave, that's just going to be the same no matter what. I treat the slave like my blood, better than my own blood. Slavery is slavery in general. All right? Everyone understand this? As far as things that are slightly different, then of course, with regards to. Rights of slaves, responsibilities of slaves, rewards of slaves, okay? And I think the foundation of all of that is the true teachings of the religion. The true teaching of the religion, or the true teachings of the religion, okay? In which the gospel is quoted for you to remain subservient and obedient to me. But anything other than that, the gospel is never quoted. Jesus was a kind man, a patient man, a tolerant man, a forbearing man, a clement man. But I beat you until I rip your skin open with a coarse, thick leather whip. Would Jesus do that? Would Christ beat someone like that? Okay? And we know that one of the most important principles of the abolitionist movement and before the Civil War, etc., between the North and the South, the Yankees and the, those that were in the South, the rich, cultured people, etc., was, is slavery an abomination or not? And is it mandated by God or not? So those who are in the South, they clearly said that slavery is allowed. Slavery was mentioned in the First Testament. Abraham has slaves. Solomon has slaves. This prophet, this righteous person has slaves. And the New Testament did not abolish that. It did not mention that you have to free them and manumit all of them. And those who were in the North, they said there was an abomination. The peculiar 
what? Institution. This, this society of treating people like this, degrading them, dehumanizing them, etc. And you're opposing the way of Christ. You're opposing the way of Christianity. You're opposing the way of teaching the people that they're all children of God, what they say and what they believe. So the southerners called them heretics. You guys are not following the teachings. And the northerners called them hypocrites for not following all of the teachings. So the concept of talking about slavery in a religion is that you have to follow all of the rules of that religion. And that is one of the differences between Islam and the other parts of the world or other institutions. Not the Muslims. We said Islam. And that is a slave has rights. A slave is not to be violated and railroaded and you can do whatever you want with them. Everyone understand this? It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Punishment, reward, sexual intercourse doesn't work like that. You can't just do whatever you want to do. Okay, so the Islam has given detailed legislation with regards to owner, master, slave, etc. So that's one of the differences. And of course we have other differences, greater, bigger, the concept of slavery being an institution with regards to race and color, with regards to ethnicity, with regards to age, with regards to this, and the concept of how slaves are obtained and why they're obtained and the wisdom behind that versus other institutions. Slaves only come from this tribe. Slaves only come from this continent. Slaves only come from women. Slaves only come from people who are this. So there are differences. There are differences. At the end of the day, the concept of slavery is always going to be a sensitive topic. It's always going to be a very extremely delicate topic. There's no doubt about that. For people that are black and people that are white. Black people who actually felt and are still feeling the effects of slavery to this day in 2019. And it's easy for someone who comes from Palestine or comes from Pakistan or comes from Somalia to say this and to say that. It's easy for you to say, oh, look at black people in America. They're like this. They're like that. It's easy for you to say. And maybe they are. Or maybe some of that is true. But that's what? Easy for you to say. You don't know what it's like to come from this. You don't know what it's like to be born into this. You don't know what it's like to this father and mother. You, don't know, you have no what? Clue of the level of atrocity and subhuman treatment. You don't, you don't have an idea. And just because the emancipation, or procl the, the, the proclamation, right? Just because that happened, that doesn't mean that what? Slavery was over. People were still in bondage, let alone Willie Lynch and civil rights up to this day. Up to this day. So you don't have a clue, all right? You don't have an idea. So that's food for thought. And be mindful of what you say. And you don't have an idea what slavery is like for white people. As an uh, author of a book about slavery once said that slavery, this was her opinion. I'm not saying I believe this. She said it in Islam. She said slavery is a curse to the black and to the white. And the uh, people that have to live with tremendous guilt and shame and people who pump and promote and propagate uh, treatment of women, human rights, and so on and so forth. Your whole entire family lineage came from the violation of human rights according to you. Everything that you own and have, this city, this capital, these buildings were made from people that were violated according to what you're... So they have a tremendous amount of guilt and shame. You understand what I'm saying to you? And the people trying to bridge the gaps of race uh, and class is oftentimes, what? Extremely hectic. Someone tries to make a joke. Hey, isn't that right? Uh, you know, you guys are good at... What? Oh, yeah. My, I like... Oh, slow down. And the person wasn't trying to be racist. And he wasn't trying to make a joke about black people. He's just trying to what? I had a whore. So even to this day, all right? So it's a very sensitive topic. And oftentimes, people, they talk about movies being haram. It's haram to watch a movie because of music. It's haram to watch a movie because of nakedness. It's haram to watch a movie because of taswir. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But I think one of the most negative effects of movies is that it has control over your emotions. And it paints the picture of how you're supposed to feel about a situation. You can't tell me after watching Roots, the old edition and the new edition, that you're going to just swallow that cup of slavery that easily. After watching this scene, Kunta Kente and Kizzy being sold and taken from the plantation. It has an effect on your emotions. And the same applies to war and killing and people being killed and losing their lives. You can't have the same conception of war when you read it after watching that what? That tear-jerking emotional movie in which the people have millions of dollars that they spend and finding a way to pierce your heart with a needle to impregnate your mind of how you're supposed to feel about fighting or this or that and so on and so forth. So it's very dangerous. I remember saying this. We were all raised watching that movie if some of us actually read the book and the serious ills that were in that, con that institution. All right? 
So therefore, this is going to be a difficult topic, a sensitive topic. There are people that are for it, people that are against it. There are people who talk about it with the proper knowledge is in Islam and outside of Islam. And there are going to be a lot of people at Sheikh Hussain Taymiyyah will be al-batili tarat. Will be al-haqi. He says that people talk about Allah and His attributes and the qadr and sharab al-haqi tarat. Occasionally they say the truth and with the batil what? Tarat. Most cases. So people black, white, who talk about slavery without the proper knowledge and without the proper education. Extremists and zealots, people that are just overnight scholars on a topic and they have a detailed explanation of it. And which they're saying all the white people did this, all the black people did that, we never did this, and so on and so forth. The facts, that's it. The truth shall set you free. In the deen and in the dunya. All right, so that's my advice. If you want to talk about slavery and discuss slavery, make sure that you go into it with an empty cup and allow facts to be the only thing to go into your what? Your cup. Nothing else. Emotions, feelings, opinions, culture, but nothing but hardcore ilm. Deen ilm and what? Dunya ilm. With regards to what slavery was and what it what? What it wasn't. That's my advice. Allah Alam. Minister, please do see Stockholm, Sweden. Where can one get the HD beanie and hoodies? Questions from Stockholm, Sweden. Where can one get the HD beanies and hoodies? I believe you can go on hadithdiscipleshop.com and you should see what's in stock there with regards to the beanies and the hoodies, inshallah. Initial W, B, Ham, Question is from Dearborn. Ham Tramp, Michigan. Ham Tramp, Michigan? Yeah. Sorry. How authentic is the Muatta Imam Malik? Imam Malik's book of the Muatta is one of the best and one of the most authentic books of Hadith. And one of the earliest surviving books of Hadith. All right? It is a book in which يعني, scholars have accepted it and they have taken it and they have adopted that book as a mainstay, a prop, a pillar of the Hadith library. That does not mean, nor does it necessitate, that every single hadith in that book is authentic. It does not mean that. It does not mean that. Just like any other what? A book of hadith. It does not necessitate. لا يلزم من هذا. That every single hadith it doesn't mean that. But as a whole, no doubt about that, Imam Malik's book is a tremendous work. Uh, and the scholars from the time of Imam Malik to this day have been amazed. All right? And they have marveled at that book. They have served it. They have explained it. They have summarized it. They have criticized it. They have expounded upon it. They have expanded it, etc. So Imam Malik's Muatta is a must read for any student of knowledge, any student of hadith, and any student of fiqh. Wallahu alam. Ibrahim A. Augusta, Georgia. Can you check your email for questions when you get a chance? Inshallah. Zakallah khaira. Chef of UK, what advice can I give to a Sufi? Simple. قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ فَمَسْتَقِمْ Say, I believe in Allah, and then be steadfast and upright. What's meant by أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ? How do you أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ? How do you believe in Allah? Where do you get your belief about Allah from? What's the source of that? Huh? What's, what's mandatory upon you? Alright, and then what's meant by فَمَسْتَقِمْ Be steadfast and upright. What's meant by that? How you want to do it? How your sheikh says it? What the orthodox sources say? Balance, extremism, etc. That's the best advice I can say. قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ Don't argue with the Sufi. Don't fight with them. Don't, don't lock horns with them if you don't have to. If they want to argue and fight as a purpose of benefit, then that's one thing. You have a close relationship with them and they, they need a little bit of, you know, pulling and tugging, wrestling and wrestling to get them to see the truth. That's one thing. But just somebody on the street, on a train, abusing him, going outside and speaking his corner with a baseball bat, hitting him upside his head, you're a Sufi, la la la, avoid that. That's not going to bring no good to the situation. And in most cases, it's not going to do anything but solidify the stereotypes of people who say that they're Salafi or on the Sunnah or Ahl al-Hadith or whatever. Give them advice, be kind to them, show them the right way. If they take it, then alhamdulillah. If he comes back with another question, he has something else which is doubtful or a specious argument further, you help him out. And if you don't know the answer, steer him in the direction of someone who can. Don't fight, don't argue, don't abuse. Unless it's a close friend of yours, someone that you work with, and someone that actually respects you, and you actually have to what? Just a bit for them to get the point. Hmm? In a proper way. Wallahu alam. Initials R.A. Edmonton, California. What's a good book for a beginner that covers...
offers all of the obligatory knowledge upon Edmonton. Edmonton, question is, a good book that covers the obligatory fundamental things that every Muslim must know. Ad-Durus al-Muhimma li al ummah The important lessons for the general masses of the Muslims by Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz. is an excellent book. Easily written, explained, simple book. Ad-Durus al-Muhimma li al ummah And the book is in English. And they also have notes to the book as well. Wallahu alam. Thanks for the SM running your page. Is it better to vote for a liberal Muslim candidate who will protect our rights or should we not support their un-Islamic practices? Questions from London. Is it better to vote for someone who's liberal, a Muslim who's going to support and protect their rights versus someone who what? Versus someone who or, or, or should we just totally avoid it and not support the system? Tell you, Allahumma sta'an yani. Voting, I think, like many other issues, I think, I said, I think, my opinion, I'm not saying this is Quran and Sunnah, the scholars, well, I think humbly, like many other issues, should not be and cannot be isolated from the bigger picture. I don't think you can just take the crust from the pie and ignore the rest of the pie. It doesn't work like that. Why is voting bad? Why is voting haram? Why is voting this? Why is it that? In light of the whole picture or just the simple concept of putting a ballot in? System of government, sharia, ruler, leader, khalifa, this, this, and that is a whole what? An entire system that voting is an infringement upon that what? System. But to just isolate it and not to talk and speak about the other major issues is going to lead to confusion and contradiction, right? But people talk about the military. You can't go to the military. It's haram. But supporting the kuffar, allowing their jets to refuel in our bases, etc. That's what? It's okay. To feed them, to pay for them, to support them, that's what? That's okay. To, and the list goes on. It, it, it's a piece of a what? A whole thing. Are we understand this? So voting, it pertains to al-wala wal bara. It pertains to the Islamic ruling of seeking leadership, of lying, claiming that which you don't have. Al-Mutashabbi' bima lam yu'ata kalabisi thawbayzur. The Prophet Sallallahu says, he who acts and he flaunts and he fakes that which he really doesn't have. Al-Mutashabbi'u bima lam yu'ata. He who's full of something that he didn't even eat. It's like the one who wears the two articles of false clothes, the articles of yani, zur. Wearing a vest and a what? Three-piece suit and you ain't got a dime in your what? In your pocket. Huh? You got a, a tie and you what? Broke as what? Joke. Can't pay attention. <laughs> so broke you can't pay attention. You're faking the what? The funk. The funk. Or the pocket pin, the ghutra, fresh, clean, the beard. <sighs> yani, yani. And you're going to Aleph Bata. <laughs> so it's a problem. Imagine me coming to the gym, right? And I'm like, <sighs> flexing. Oh, yeah. Time to get it in. Rip right. <sighs> ah. And then I struggle with one pull up. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So a fraud, a sham. Huh? So we have to be mindful of, of these elements that make voting what? A problem. And when you just isolate it from the bigger picture, you're going to fall into contradiction. We live in the non Muslim lands under their protection, pay their taxes, receive the benefits from the government. That's all Kufar system. My children go to school, I enjoy this, I own a house, I have freedom, I have protection of police. Is that not the Kufar system? Do all countries enjoy that freedom and that protection? Yeah. No, they do not. What the second world or third world country? The whole communism versus capitalism system. So don't just point out, oh, voting is evil, it's haram, you're voting for the taghut, so on and so forth. But this is also taghut, and it's also supporting taghut, and it's also defending or being protected by the... Mushkila, all right? So at the end of the day, if the Muslims live in these countries, and many of them, if not most of them, are going to die in these countries, they're going to have children in these countries, they're going to own businesses in these countries, how can the Muslims have no political representation? It's ludicrous. Absolutely, sheerly ludicrous. In which we have a thousand people, 500, uh, thousand people, a million people will live in a place, man, woman, child, birth, death, sick, Business and we have no political involvement and no political representation. Can't have that. And if the system is that messed up, then why are the Muslims living in these lands of the Taghut? 
Yeah, you, know, you understand what I'm saying to you? So I think the people need to really sit down and think about voting transparently. Look at the pros, the cons. Look at the necessities versus things that you don't need. And look at the harm and the benefits. And maybe sometimes you may have to vote, perhaps. Or maybe it's best to vote for this one instead of what? That one. But the whole concept of politics and what do you say? He says, I'm a politician. So that means I'm a what? A liar and a, and a cheat. And a cheat. <laughs> automatically. If I'm a politician, I'm automatically what? A liar and a cheat. So you have, to be, you have to understand what politics are and what they aren't. All right? Why does a person say, I'm going to stand up for your rights and I'm going to do this for you and I'm going to fight for you? Why? You benefit him, but he also what? So you have to understand the game. You have to understand the game. Here at my mosque, I have 500 people. A thousand people, two, three thousand people, they're all going to vote for you on December 3rd, all of them. But we need a sign on the street saying don't park your car for Juma unless you're in the Amen. Bottom line. We need a, a police station on the corner to protect the school, whatever. You do that for us and what? You have your votes. Five thousand votes guaranteed. It's a game. But you just go and voting without demanding, without necessitating without understanding how it works, then you're just going to lose. And the person is going to make a promise and break it, make a deal and cheat you, etc. It, it, it's, there's levels of a chain of command. So it's not that simple and easy of an answer. If you had to choose between one of the two, pick the lesser of the two shaitans, or the lesser of the two evils. Wallahu alam. The question is from where? Country Club Hills, Illinois. Country Club Hills, Illinois. With regards to watches, bags, sunglasses, things like this, do they count as a dormant? And do they take the same ruling? Apple watches, etc. It depends on why you're asking the question. You're in the state of Ihram. A woman wearing it outside the house or in front of nine mahram men, paying a cat on them, etc. So a dormant has different categories of rulings. When you're in the state of Ihram, can you wear a watch? Can you wear sunglasses? Can you wear nice glasses, nice frames? Everyone understand this? Can you have a gold-plated watch? It depends on the what? The specific category. A woman versus a man. It depends. If a woman has an Apple watch and it's shown, it is, you can see it from under her abaya. Is that Zena, etc.? It depends on what? Exactly why you're asking about that adornment. Because adornment has different... I can't. Wallahu alam. For a woman or a man? I guess, okay, I guess a woman? Not us. It's not like makeup, but it shouldn't be a thing in which it's too fancy and too flashy. But there is no command that you have to have the ugliest, worst glasses on your eyes. A sister who wears glasses and she has some quality glasses on, there's nothing wrong with that. And alhamdulillah, there's so many different brands and companies that make glasses that are nice and quality, but at the same time, what? Simple, but... Those who know about glasses, what? No. MashaAllah. We got those. You understand know what I'm saying to you? And the same applies to a watch and things like this. It's a balance. It's a balance, huh? And that which is done accidentally, it's not like that which is done. Hmm? Hmm? Like Questions from Columbus. Reciting. The Quran, according to the Maqamat. May Allah bless you as well. Bless all of our brothers and sisters in Columbus as well. Tayyip. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, مَا بَعْثَ اللَّهُ مِنْ نَبِيٍ إِلَّا كَانَ حَقًا عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يُدُلَّ أُمَّتَهُ عَلَى خَيْرِ مَا يَعْلَمُهُ لَهُمْ وَأَنْ يُنْذِرُهُمْ شَرَّ مَا يَعْلَمُهُ لَهُمْ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ سَلَامُ In authentic hadith, the Prophet, alayhi says, Allah has never sent a Prophet. He never sent a Prophet. Except that it was the prophet's duty and his job, meaning the, the, the most basic of his duties was to show his ummah the good that he knows his ummah can achieve. And to warn his ummah from the evil that he knows that they can possibly fall. And that was the basic duty of every prophet and messenger. So the prophet said, did he recite in the maqamat? Did he tell the companions to recite in the maqamat? Did Ubay ibn Kabr anhu, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ibn Mas'ud, did they recite in the maqamat? Did their students do it? We know the answer. Of course they did not. So therefore it should not be done. 
And the one who continues to do it and practices it and believes it's getting him closer to Allah and is a special reward, is no da'i. He's going to fall into huh? bid'ah. Wallahu alam. Fort Worth, Texas, approach a new job, your benefits, 401k, insurance, etc. Like we said about voting. Yeah. What can you do? Nam? What type of job are you looking for? A job, a salary, a career versus a coming type goal type of job. Do you have children? Are you married? Are you going to go out of your pocket every time you go to the dentist? Yeah. This is a serious question. Your daughter, she falls down the steps, she breaks her ankle, may Allah prevent are you going to come out of your pocket for the ambulance? It's a serious question. All right? When you grow old, what are you going to do? Are you going to rent a house for the rest of your life? This is a what? Serious question. Serious question living in 2019 in the world in which we live. So you have to be mindful of that. 401k, the detail with regards to that is the halal or haram. Insurance, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, it's an integral part of our daily lives. Get pulled over by a police officer without what? Insurance. What's going to happen? I mean... They lock you up. Take your license. Then you have to get on a bus with the kufar. This is the reality. You have to free mix with the kufar, men, women. Allah, Musan, what can you do? What can you do? Allah, what is the minimum distance for a mandatory to pray in congregation at the mosque? There are no speakers for the event. The question is from Malaysia. Johor? What is the mandatory? What is the distance? Between your home in the mosque or your shop in the mosque, which makes it obligatory for you to pray in the mosque. There are no speakers, etc. You have to make an estimation. If things were quiet and slow, could you hear the voice of a normal and average muadhin? A muadhin whose voice is robust. He's on the roof, he's in a minaret, he makes the call to the prayer. How far would his voice normally travel? On average. If you live in a place in which there are blocks, estimate blocks. If you live in a village or a very rural place, estimate the distance. So an easy way of doing this is sending your friend to the mosque or the masjid. And then you yourself make the event. Allah, Hu Akbar, Allah, Hu Akbar. And see if your friend can hear you. He comes back and says, I heard you clear as day. That was two blocks or that was ten trees or whatever. However you measure the distance, right? It was the next island. You may be in a tropical location. Uh, in which I heard you on this part. You can row across to the next island, whatever, wherever you are. And you know that's obligatory. As the Prophet Sallallahu said in the authentic hadith, Hal tasma'un nida'a bis salah. He says, do you hear the call? The man said, yes. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, fa'ajib. He says, then answer. So the scholars of Islam who hold the view that prayer and congregation is mandatory, they base the distance that it becomes mandatory upon this. Whether you hear it or whether it's the what? Distance, so you have to gauge it and measure it. You have to gauge it and measure it, but you can't gauge it and measure it in a loud metropolis in which there's cars or there are cars or planes and so much static that comes between the silence of a blackout. So it could be in New York City, what three blocks, maybe four blocks on average. And if that isn't the case, if it's a little far from you, there's nothing wrong with going to the mosque, it's a virtue, even if it's far. It's a virtue even if it isn't in the mandatory space. Hmm? Wallahu alam. Fadda. Um, question regarding um, getting a hair transplant. A hair transplant? Okay. For, um, Can you rinse this off of me, please? To prevent your hair from, but, um, from your hair from receding. Okay. And you're not married yet. Tight. Don't get a hair transplant, nor get any type of permanent surgery. You can just rinse it. Inshallah, yeah. Any type of permanent surgery, permanent surgery that's going to keep your hair or keep your hair from fading or being pushed back and such. Don't do that. Taking natural things, herbs, you know, pills, natural tonic, things like this, natural elements. Permanent surgery, no. I wouldn't advise with that. And Allah alam, that's permissible. I, I, I any doubt it. What's important is, is that if you're young and you're age or your ethnicity, or your family background has strong, uh, what do you call it? Um, Genes. No, hair, what do you call it? What? Receding. Male, male pattern. Male, male, male? Male pattern baldness. Male pattern baldness. That's natural. 
that's natural. And if the woman likes you, she's going to like you. Whether you have a lot of hair or not. Go to the sit down with a kufi on. Huh? Wallahu alam. Fadda. Fadda. is. Yeah. Huh? It's lamb. So say you live with Muslims and you have Zabiha and then they take that. Zabiha. Zabiha. And they take that and cook it on Thanksgiving. Does that make the meat haram? Allahu Akbar. It depends how good it is. I say. If the turkey is nice, then what? Mumkin. Cranberry sauce, stuffing, uh, baked macaroni and cheese, string beans, uh, sweet potato pie, warm apple cider, warm apple cider yeah. uh, the dinner rolls with the butter. Need we what? Say, <laughs> Say <no>. more. <laughs> huh? At the end of the day, it's not haram to eat food that you would normally eat just because it's a Christian or mushrik or Jewish or whatever type of holiday. Okay? But... You're giving it to non-Muslims. They're cooking it during their holiday in the style of their holiday. Giving it to you on their holiday is something I would say do not enjoin. Do not partake in that. Do not go near that. But get your grandmother to make the turkey a week before Thanksgiving or what? After. A week after Thanksgiving. There's nothing wrong with that. And inshallah ta'ala be means of da'wah. And it be a means being that ta'ala of you being kind to your grandmother. She wants to cook for you. You went, to, you, you went overseas or you went to jail, you went here, you came back as a Muslim saint, you don't come visit me no more. We're all sinners, we're going to hell. I miss you, you were this, huh? Yay hi, you used to walk around in the yard and I used to look after you when your father went to work and your mother went to work. You broke my heart. So you have to patch that up. Grandma, you come over with halal turkeys, hook it up. Bismillah. Nothing wrong with that, family meeting, but not on what, November? 28th, 27th, 29th. That's <laughs> Hmm? Wallahu alam. Sheikh Yusuf. Um, in Quran, was there any concept of uh, definitive um, what Islam says about insurance? The reference is like, you know, definitive or Islamic? For sure, yeah. Or I mean, the, it's the clear. The insurance, the definitive principles of insurance being halal or haram or it being haram is that it includes certain elements which are haram, such as bayul al and jahala. Okay, gambling. You paying something and not knowing exactly what you're getting back. The interest that is involved with insurance. You understand what I'm saying to you? Putting rules and things upon people that aren't, that aren't necessarily mandatory. So these are some of the elements which lead to that ijtihad of insurance being haram. The, the, the surah of the insurance. Not all types, but the surah in which you pay a certain amount. You pay this, it goes up, etc. It's risky. It's, 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 it's knowledge... It lacks knowledge of what you're getting, what you're paying for, etc. All right. So these are the animina the wabit. All right. These are from the, the the definitive rules, and of course we know that we have the an kawaid fiqhia, and the mashakata tajribu taysir. It's extreme difficulty that necessitates facilitation. Going living in a place without a car, going living in a place and someone can vandalize your property, break into your property, your children, their dentists. So many things that you will be, your back will be broken if you have to pay for what out of your pocket, let alone you'll be arrested or you know, jailed or you'll be penalized by the authorities for not obeying the rules of insurance. All right, so it, if it's absolutely haram, then for sure there are going to be certain rules that make it certain types halal or, or obligatory, depending on these issues. <laughs> والله أعلم أرجو أن يكون هذا الكلام واضحا إن شاء الله فضل um, the brother didn't really give full detail to the question he didn't give justice to the question لا 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 that's فضل so this is slaughtered meat from Eid al-Adha الله أكبر that was in the freezer and that was taken without his permission and cooked okay for Thanksgiving okay now he wants to know can he eat it clear so he slaughtered a turkey on either other? No, it was lamb. Lamb. I don't know the ruling on this. I don't know people that cook lamb on Thanksgiving. Next question. <laughs> I'm not falling for that set up question. Nobody <laughs> 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 making lamb chops on Thanksgiving. At the end of the day, I don't call it in the been yet. It wasn't your intention. It wasn't you didn't have the intention to celebrate the holiday. You didn't have the intention to enjoy their 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 you know their festival. 
It was lawful meat, halal meat. They took it without your knowledge. They cooked it for you. Of course. It's not like you intended it. It's not like you said, oh, make it for Thanksgiving. And perhaps from the important points of the ruling, and Allah knows best, is that it's not turkey. It's not turkey. It's lamb. And of course, non-Muslims, they cook ham and other things on Thanksgiving, but that's the what? Staples. No doubt. There's no question about it. That's the staple part of the holiday and of the tradition. Now, Thanksgiving, like many other holidays, a great part of them have become totally secular. Totally secular. And there are people who celebrate the holiday who have nothing to do with Christianity or the Puritans or the Native Americans or the settlers, period. It's just a day in which we eat turkey. That's the custom. So uh, there are details, but it's not something that you did intentionally. It's not from your knowledge that it was going to be made for Thanksgiving. They cooked it. It's a day in which your mother, your sister, your grandmother's in the kitchen. They made it for you to look out for you. I won't say it's haram. Wallahu alam. Any other questions? صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا